Uh, we're finishing up the book of Romans. We will actually finish it next week. Um, but we are jumping in here to Romans chapter 16. To give you a little bit of uh, uh, context for the book of Romans. And also, uh, this is, I feel like, this is my third sermon in the book of Romans in the past week. Uh, which is always fun. If you're here Sunday, uh, I got to preach Sunday, uh, which is always a good time. And I felt like when I told the church to open to the book of Romans, I just felt like muscle memory at this point. Uh, but yeah, we are, uh, if, you, if you have not really studied the book of Romans, what you'll find is that it is kind of, you can break it up essentially into two sections. You have the first 11 chapters where you have Paul uh, essentially explaining the gospel. He's explaining how it is that you and I have been made right with God through Jesus Christ and, and, and what God has done to make that possible for us. And then how he has applied salvation, all these incredible truths. And then you get to chapter 12 where Paul's going to pivot. He's going to talk about, okay, because of these mercies of God that he has laid out for 11 chapters, because of this, here's what you should do with it. So here we had 11 chapters of explanation, and then we have the rest of the book is application. How do you apply this? And we've kind of looked at this over the past several weeks. Last week, we talked about this idea of how because of what God has done for us in the gospel, that this should be something that unites us. We should be united in Christ, and we shouldn't be divided over things that just don't really matter, Right? That we should be able, there's some things that we do divide over, and then there's some things that we should not divide over. And how do we handle those things when there's differences that arise amongst us as believers that are things that are not worth dividing over? How do we deal with those things? And what is the, the significance of being united in Christ, having united congregation, a united church? And that was chapter 14, so some of you are like, well, why are we jumping into chapter 16? Because chapter 15 is essentially a continuation of that point, right? So Paul is continuing this idea of the need for unity within the body of Christ and, and its importance. And he even give, he gives the explanation of, how, of, of Christ, how Christ put others before himself and all of these incredible, incredible things. Then we get uh, to the end of chapter 15 where Paul is going to start kind of closing out his letter. He's going to start to kind of land the plane uh, to what many would say is the greatest letter of all of Paul's letters is the book of Romans. This is kind of like prime Paul, right? So you, you think of like your favorite athlete, whatever it is. You have like, you know, prime Michael Jordan, prime LeBron James, prime these, like, this is prime Paul here in the book of Romans. And he's kind of landing the plane on this letter, and he's basically giving some personal remarks, right? So, hey, I'm giving, all right, hey, you know, say hi to your mom and them, and say hi to this person. And, and then he's kind of saying, hey, I, I, I can't wait to hopefully come and see you, uh, because he's writing this letter from Corinth, uh, which is the church with the Corinthians. So he's in Corinth as he is writing to the Romans. He's saying, hey, I, I hope to come and see you, uh, but, you know, I've got these things coming on, but someday, hopefully, Hopefully on my way to Spain, I will see you. So he, he has, oh, Paul's plan is to take the gospel to Spain, which in his mind is essentially the ends of the world, uh, and basically take the gospel to Spain, and on his way, he would stop by the church in Rome to say hi, right? See how they're doing. Now we get to chapter 16, right? So Paul is continuing these personal remarks in chapter 16 uh, to, the, to the believers in this church. So here's what we're going to do. I want to encourage you, if you have it, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read it. If you don't, it should be on the screen. But I'm going to encourage all of us to stand uh, out of reverence for the word of the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 16, starting in verse 1. There's a lot of names in here, so be patient with me, all right? I commend to you our sister Phoebe a servant of the Lord at Sincre, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in, uh, in their house. Greet my beloved Apeanet, Ape Apenetus, Apenetus, whew, golly, uh, who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and, Ju and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet uh, Ampliatus, uh, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, uh, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. 
Philus. Greet my kinsmen Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphenia and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, uh, chosen in the Lord, also his mother who has been a mother to me as well. Greet also, uh, sorry, greet uh, Asyncritus, uh, Flesian, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brothers who are with them. Greet uh, Phil Philologus, oh, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you you if you would pray father i thank you for your word god i know that your word says that it will accomplish that which you have set forth to accomplish so father we ask that your word will accomplish your will in our hearts and in our lives this evening we thank you and we praise you in the name of your son jesus amen all right so what a fun passage right uh i think that there's a lot of times when we read our bibles it's part of this too is like okay uh why would i you know i skipped some sections and in chapter 15, uh, why would I land here, right? Why would I stop and decide to preach uh, a bunch of names and a bunch of say hi to this person and say hi to Bob and Bill and Sally and Susan, right? Why would I do this? Uh, so uh, I think that we have a tendency when we read our Bibles uh, to, to we, we, we have a tendency that when we get to certain portions of the Bible, we tend to either skip them or just skim through them at a surface level. You know what I'm trying to say? That uh, this could be, if it, maybe it's a story that you've read a lot, you've heard it a lot, and you just kind of like, yeah, I, I know what this is, and I keep going. Or maybe it's like a series of names and stuff, like, or kind of like what we just read, and you're like, all right, well, like, there's nothing really in here that's super deep for me to understand, so I'm just going to kind of keep going through whatever it may be. Uh, and I think when we do this, we neglect what Scripture tells us about the Word of God, which is that all Scripture, is God-breathed and useful for teaching, right? And I think what we need to understand is, okay, man, if all Scripture, and trust me, in my Bible reading plan right now, I am just finishing up the book, book of Leviticus, and trust me, it is not super thrilling to, to make it through, you know, commands and instructions on the law of what to do with certain skin diseases, right? Like, okay, all right, Lord, right? Your word is inspired, right? So what do we do with this? I think what I want us to understand is, man, there's a, the reason that God has this in his word is he has it in here for a reason, and we should understand what that reason is, right? So uh, as you are reading in here, I think there's a few things that are important for us to note. One, you will see Paul mention 24 people by name in this section. You're going to 24 people by name in this section alone. And right away, what this tells us is something very important, is that this is a real letter written by a real historical person to real historical people. You with me? That one, right away, what this should help us to understand is that this is not just something that was written, uh, concocted together. No, what this does is this adds a historic element to this letter to help us know that these are re real people that Paul is writing to. And not only are these real people that Paul is writing to, is that these are regular people. Right? That he's not writing to a series of theologians. He's not writing to a series of philosophers. He's writing to everyday mom and pop people in the church in Rome, like you and like me. But as we get into the closing portions of this letter, I feel that there are some really good observations that we can make based on Paul's remarks here. And one thing I think that we're going to see, the overall point that I want us to see, is that I think that what you see in this letter is you see a lot of really good principles about how we as Christians should function within the local church. How we as Christians, how you and me should function within the local church. Because I think if you've grown up around church, or even if you haven't grown up around church, that there is automatically an assumption of how, how Christians act in a church setting. All right, this is what we do. We get together, we do this, we do that, and, and, and all of these different things. And I think that what we're going to see here is that there are some important things that we're going to pull out about just some simple observations about this passage. So if you know me, this is probably not the typical way that you would expect me to preach through a passage. Typically, we're going to go through it. We're going to, hey, verse by verse, kind of tackle what does this mean, all these different things. But what we're going to do is we're going to stay, you know, at the 30,000-foot level. We're going to see what are some, some big observations that we can pull out of this passage. All right, we're going to get a clear picture of what the church is supposed to look like and how we are called to operate within it. So observation number one is the importance of godly women serving in the church. Now, I'll right away, everyone in the room, 
right, is like, oh, right? Where are we going with this? Where are we going with this, Pastor Mike? And I'm so glad you asked, right? The first person that we see named in this entire section is a woman named Phoebe. Now, I don't know about you. Every time I hear the name Phoebe, I think of uh, Friends. I think of Phoebe Buffet. Uh, and I don't know if there's anybody in it. Does anybody in here ever watch Friends? Okay, that's fine. It makes me feel a little bit old. That's okay. Uh, I mainly watch it because my wife. My wife really loves the show. Then I, was, I started watching it with her. I'm like, oh, this is a pretty good show. All right, so anyway. All right, so a woman named Phoebe. Now, uh, the passage gives us a little bit of understanding of who Phoebe is. Phoebe is from the church that is in Sincree. Sincree is actually a port city that is a neighboring city to the church in Corinth, right? So they're, they're, so Sincree is a city that is right next to the city of Corinth. And most likely, this is most likely when she, he says, I commend to you, Phoebe, he is doing this because Phoebe is the one delivering the letter, okay? Very likely what this is, is this is Phoebe is taking the letter that is written by Paul to the church in Rome, and he is saying, hey, welcome her, right? Accept her. I, I am the one who sent her. Likely, uh, this is what he's doing. Paul commends Phoebe to all the believers in Rome, and he does this in three ways. You see it in the text. The three ways he does this is one. He refers to her as someone who is, uh, uh, who is a sister in Christ, She's a sister in Christ, she is a servant of the church, and she is a helper of many, including himself. All right, so there's three things right away that we see about Phoebe. Now, for, from these three things, we see a few things. One, we see that she was, what, a devoted believer and a member of the family of God, right? That we call, you know, this is something that, you know, especially if you kind of grow up in church in the South, we're like, hey there, brother, right? Like, hey, brother. Oh, that's Brother Bill over here, and and then you got you know Sister Ann and and all these different things, right? Like, why do we do this, right? Because ultimately, what we're seeing is that uh, we are what we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are part of the family of God. That we have one heavenly Father, and because of that, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul is calling her sister, saying, "Hey, she is a devoted follower of the Lord." Then he's going to refer to her in two ways. Now. There's a lot more that we can get into. You could have a whole series or, to or sermon just on this topic. But we're, again, we're going to stay kind of surf surface level. So just hang with me, all right? He's going to refer to her in two other ways, right? So sister in Christ and also a servant, right? Servant of the church. This word servant in the Greek is the word diakonos, which is the same word that is used to refer to the office of deacons in the church, okay? So he's referring to her as a servant, Right? Servant of the church. That one who serves in the church. Now, that's very, very significant. Right? And we're going to get some more stuff about that in a second. Right? Elsewhere in the passage, we're going to see that Paul is specifically speaking of godly women in the church and other women. Right? There's Phoebe. There's Priscilla. There's Mary. There's Tryphena. There's Tryphosa. There's the mother of Rufus. There's Julia. We see much about how God used these women in the church. He says that they, la they labored for the Lord. They labored much for the Lord. The mother of Rufus, Paul says, is, one, is a woman who acted as a form of a mother towards him. Now, why do I focus on this? What, 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 what in the world does this have to do with anything? Because here's the deal. There are a lot of people who will tell you that the Bible degrades women. Especially, this is, this is a common thing, right? Right now, very rarely do you have people who will argue that God does not exist. You don't really see that as much anymore as you used to. But what you do find now is, okay, if I can't, I'm not going to attack your belief in God. What I will do is I will attack the, the validity of the Bible. Right? This is, and if you notice, and it's not, you shouldn't be surprised by this, right? This is what I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to give you, a, you know, some a backstage look at how, how people will come against you. Is they're going to try and convince you how the Bible has all these issues in it. So that ultimately, if you mistrust the Bible, if you can't trust the Bible, if you can't trust God's sole revelation of himself apart from Jesus Christ, which we read about in the Bible, then how can you trust anything about your faith, right? So, but, so that what they'll do is they'll say the Bible, it, it's degrading to women, it's misogynistic, it's all of these different things. Uh, the Bible says that it, it, you know, people say that the Bible denies women the right to serve and lead in any capacity in the church, right? They'll point to a handful of verses to try and make their argument. Here's the problem that they make. The problem that they make is that the person who wrote those verses that they refer to that degrade women and talk bad about women is the same person who wrote these verses, so how does that work? How is it that Paul can commend women serving in the church, but at the same time people will say that he forbids them from doing anything in the church? Is it possible that we're misunderstanding something? Right? We're misunderstanding something. 
right? Because here's the deal that, that they need to understand and you and I need to understand is that we do not have the luxury of just taking whatever scriptures we want to try and affirm our points, right? That's not how you read your Bible. How you read your Bible is this, is that you take this verse, you take this verse, and you weigh it against other verses until you can come to an understanding to where they all make sense, right? You weigh scripture against scripture. So, these are difficult questions. And if you know me, let's not run from difficult questions. Let's run to them. Let's run to this question. What, what is it, how is it that women are called to be able to serve in the church? This is important, right? A couple of times in scripture, Paul will say that women are to remain quiet or to learn quietly in the church. Now, there are two ways in which this is often taken. And they typically, again, like we talked about last week, people will go to the extreme ends of the argument, right? They'll go to the extreme ends. One of the ways that people will take is they will say that, okay, women are not allowed to speak at all in church, that they should sit there and be quiet. That's what they say. That's what the, ba- that's what the Bible says. Blah, 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 blah. The Bible says this, whatever. And then you'll have others who will say, well, this was entirely based on the cultural things that were going on at the time, and that doesn't apply anymore. I think both are incorrect interpretations of what the scripture teaches. And we're going to address that. We're going to address both of those at the same time, right? So you have one end that's on, over here that says, okay, women have to be quiet and be barefoot and pregnant and they can't talk in church. And then you have this, then you have this side that's going to say, well, this is culturally based and all these different things. So because of that, it doesn't apply anymore. And women could do the same exact things that any man can do in a church. We have to understand, okay, what exactly does the Bible teach? Right? The problem with the first view is that it assumes the meaning of the word quiet. It assumes the meaning of the word quiet incorrectly by ignoring other uses of the term in Scripture. See, when you study other uses of the term quiet or submissive or, or, or silent in, in Scriptures, in every instance, it, you'll find that it has more to do with the spirit of the person rather than the mouth of the person. A quiet spirit. It isn't saying the person literally is silent in speech, but rather the person has a spirit that is quiet. But even in that case, what we often do is we attribute certain connotations. When I say a connotation, right, a word has a connotation. So like, you know, uh, so like you have this word and what we do is we associate other words with it, right? This is a common thing today. And one of the mistakes that we make is that we take a word that is in Scripture and then we take a 21st century connotation and apply it to a 1st century piece of writing. Maybe that's a mistake, right? You've got to be careful with this, right? So when we talk about a quiet spirit, oftentimes today we attribute certain things with this, with submission and quietness. What we think of weak, passive, insignificant, marginalized, oppressed, and so on. But if you were to read the Bible, what you'll find is multiple instances in Scripture where we see these words quiet and submissive associated with different characteristics. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we see it associated with hopelessness. Oh, sorry, so hopefulness. Woo, excuse me. Hopefulness and fearlessness and being imperishable. In Isaiah, Isaiah 32, we see it with peacefulness. Uh, we see also in 1 Peter 3, we see it with being precious. With Isaiah, we see it being with strength. With Ecclesiastes, we see it with being uh, associated with contentment. All right, this is why we have to be careful not to just take, okay, well, in, in, in my mind it means this, so this is what the writer of the scriptures means. No, we need to see what does the writer mean, right? Not what does this text mean to you, it's what does this text mean, right? Because the writer meant something when they wrote it. We need to set aside our pre- this is uh, this, not just with this topic, with any topic. We need to approach the Bible, set aside our preconceived ideas of what we think it means, and we need to approach the Bible to seek to be taught from it. You with me? Uh, read the Bible to learn, not to affirm what you think you know. See, a humble and quiet spirit, you'll find, throughout the Bible, is used most often to refer to the conduct of both men and women. Give you an example. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, all Christians are, uh, Christians are what, called to what? Aspire to live quietly and mind your own affairs. Does this mean that Christians are commanded to live a life where they do not speak up when there's problems? Absolutely not. Why? Because we're also commanded to preach the gospel, aren't we? 
So how, is, how can you have both be true? How is it that we can be called to live quiet lives, minding our own affairs, but at the same time called to call out sin when sin arises and to preach the gospel to the people who need it? All right now, so, so, we, so we understand that we're not saying women in the church have to be silent in all of these different things. But then we go to the other end of the spectrum. That says that these verses are cultural and they don't apply anymore. And because of this, women should be pastors and all of these different things. What we should do is we need to be very, very careful when we take that argument to any pa- part of Scripture. When I can say, all right, this part of Scripture doesn't apply anymore, but this one does. Okay, what are you basing that off of? Right? Because God forbid some more significant parts don't apply, like Jesus rising from the dead. Right? You see the issue when we start to do this? So, so what exactly do we see here? Because, and again, this is not the, and there's so much more that can be said on this topic, but we're kind of like hitting surface level to kind of get through things, right? Now, the Bible is very clear. About, the, Bible, the Bible is very clear about this, is that men and women have clearly defined roles in the church. Not only in the church, but in the family as well. And that the position of pastoral shepherding over the entire congregation is for the man. Not to say that men are greater than women at all. That is not the case at all. It is just different, right? Is a woman greater than a man because she can carry a child? No. Right? We see that we, there are different clearly defined roles. Again, this is, this is why we have to be very careful when we give in to certain arguments that are very popular in the culture today. Because if you're not careful, you will concede certain points that are then going to cause issues with your reading of the scriptures. All right, 1 Timothy 2, Paul makes it very clear. Where he's, what does he say that? He talks about the role of this, this role being for the man. Now, let's be very clear that in this instance, Paul is very clearly speaking of the roles of shepherding the overall flock in the local church. Now, remember, Phoebe was referred to as a deacon. And this is, you think, okay, oh, hey, if, you, if you go to Central, you know we have deacons and different things like this. All right? You could potentially take the, the offices that are held in the church. Scripture will, will basically take, will have two offices in the church. There's deacons and elders, Right? Elders would be like what we would consider pastors. And the thing that differentiates deacons from pastors is that the deacons are not charged with the teaching ministry of leading the church doctrinally and teaching. Okay? Now, let me explain something. Does that mean that deacons never teach? No. We have deacons that are small group leaders, don't we? Yes. The difference is, is that they are not expected to carry the responsibility of preaching to the, to the entire congregation and leading the church through the pulpit. You with me? All right. That is the defining difference between a deacon and an elder or a pastor in Scripture. So here's what we need to understand. That when he says that I do not permit a woman to, to, hold a, to, to teach or to hold authority over the man, he is, what he is saying is that the role of holding authority from a preaching standpoint from the pulpit over the overall church on the, when, the, when the church gathers together on a Sunday morning is reserved for a man. Now, this is, again, this has nothing to do with the man being better than woman. If you ask me, I think this is more reflective because the church is meant to reflect the family, Right? And we're going to get to this also in a second about how the church gathered in that time. There's a lot of different reasons for this. So here's what I want you to understand. Because this, and this is, again, very, very important. That he is not saying that no, if you're in a small group setting and a woman has a point that she wants to bring up in Scripture, you should not listen. That is not what the Bible teaches. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he is saying at all. So as a man, I need to understand this. As a man and as a woman, we all need to understand this. That there are women who are gifted authors and teachers. Very gifted in those things. And here's the thing. Let's say that I, there's a female author that I really enjoy reading. Let's say, man, there's like a Priscilla Shire book that I really want to read. And there's some really good content in it. And I want to study that. Okay? Am I sinning by listening to her teaching? No. I will tell you this. Until... I seek to begin to depend on her for the shepherding of my soul. 
then I have placed a responsibility on her that Scripture does not. You with me? Does this make sense? All right. See, this isn't a matter of greater or lesser. It's a matter of roles that God has designed. So again, what does this have to do with Romans 16? What does it have to do with Romans 16? It means this, that in order for the church to thrive, I want you to know this, and, and this is like girls in particular, like please hear me, because I think you guys hear a lot of, hmm, you, you guys hear a lot of garbage, okay? I think as men, we also tend to believe a lot of garbage, but understand this, in order for the church to thrive, as God has called it and designed it to thrive, we need godly women to be actively serving within the church according to their giftings and God's design. That in order for the church to thrive, you need godly women to serve according to the giftings that God has given them within the confines of God's design for them. Does this make sense? This is important. Because we live in a world that's going to try and tell you this or this. Or, or if, you have, if you feel a calling to, to serve God with your life. And people are going to say, well, the Bible says you can't do that. And those are people who are saying that are people who probably never really study their Bibles. And here's what I also don't want you to do. If you're a girl in the room or, or whatever. Don't allow the one thing that you should not do keep you from the million things that you can. You with me? I think the perfect example of this is, is like, you know, as a man, like, it's not God's design for me to be pregnant and carry a, carry a baby, right? When my wife was pregnant, there's, man, there's, I'll, I'll tell you this, there's something magical about that. There's just a connection that my wife will have with Carly that I will never have. She felt her kicking in her womb. She, she would feel her have hiccups in her womb. She would, and it's just this beautiful, beautiful attachment that she has. And you know what? That's incredible. And you know what? I will never get that joy. But you know what I do get? I get so many other things that we could both share. And I'm not going to allow the fact that I can't feel a, a baby kick in my womb to keep me from the joys of being a father. Likewise, girls, don't lose sight of the fact that if God has gifted you, man, find God's design for how you are called to serve according to your giftings and pursue it. Run after it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't or you shouldn't. Don't let anybody tell you you can't serve God in a local church because you're a woman. And guys, if you say that to somebody, right? No, you shouldn't be able to serve God because you're being stupid. Right? There's a major difference between spiritual authority of teaching and shepherding of the overall congregation of believers and faithfully being used by God to make disciples. So that's our first observation. It's the longest one, but I think it's important. I didn't want to just kind of like, whenever I read passages like this, I'm going to give you an insight to me, okay? Again, like I said, this is very different than in a normal sermon I would give. Typically, when I read a passage, one of the things I think of is, okay, what are some questions that will come up, right? And when you read this, like, hey, like, well, let's address those questions, right? So that's the first one. All right, second observation is this, the importance of seeking a godly spouse, all right, you'll see one of the other people that he mentions here is two people named Priscilla and Aquila. All right, Priscilla, the wife, Aquila, dude, right? You have Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned actually multiple other times in Scripture. They were a husband and wife duo, and they were mentioned a handful of times, especially in the book of Acts. And what you'll find in the book of Acts, especially in Acts chapter 18, is that there was an instance where they are in Ephesus, which was a church that Paul had started, and they were there. And there was a man named Apollos. Uh, and Apollos was in the synagogue, and he was boldly preaching. Apollos is also referenced in 1 Corinthians. And he's boldly preaching God's word, boldly preaching about Jesus. And, and man, he's, he's one, he's really skilled, he's really good, he's very bold, he knows everything. But Priscilla and Aquila notice that there's some things that he doesn't fully understand yet. So what they do is they, literally, you can read it, they take him aside. You know, I'll just read it, rather than me try and 
you know, they, they take him aside and they disciple him. Right? Acts chapter 18. Do, 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 do. All right. Now a Jew named Apollos, verse 24, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him, and it goes on and goes on. And essentially what you'll find is Paul will mention this in 1 Corinthians, that Paul will sow the seeds of the gospel in Corinth, and Apollos will come after him and water those seeds, and he will disciple, and he will really kick off the church movement in Corinth. And why do I bring this up? It's because the impact that Apollos had was as a result of, of the discipleship of a husband and wife doing ministry together. Because here's the deal, and I know some of you are like, I'm in middle school, I don't care about this. Well, listen, <laughs> right? Because, and I'll say this, I'm not against uh, high school. I'm not against high schoolers dating. I'm not that kind of student pastor. Uh, I think it's good, you know, to, now I think you should know why you do it. The reason you date is to seek to find the, what God would have for you and a spouse. If that's not your intention, you're wasting their time, you're wasting your time. I'll tell you this, every relationship that you engage in, whether it be a dating relationship, will either end in marriage or a breakup. So just think about that. Either marriage or a breakup. Right? So when you seek to, so, so hey, now if you're in middle school, Sorry, wait, okay? But if you're, but if you're hey, this is, this is, yeah, so it's okay, understand this. But here's the thing that we have done. We have set this bar in the Christian world of, okay, hey, as long as they profess Jesus, as long as they're a Christian. And that's good. But here's what I want to encourage you with. Don't seek somebody who just will go to church with you. Seek somebody who will serve in the church with you. Seek someone who will get in the trenches of ministry with you, especially if you feel God calling you to vocational ministry, hear me out. If you feel God call you to be a pastor if, or God's called you to be a missionary or whatever, this is incredibly important for you. Because just because someone is a Christian doesn't mean that they are called to be a spouse of a minister. That to be a pastor's wife is just as high a calling as to be a pastor. And I'll tell you that there have been people in my life that are good Christians, but not pastor's wife material. And the most incredible thing that I love, me and, my, me and Kayla, we talked about this last night. My, one of my favorite parts of my relationship with Kayla is doing ministry with her. Doing it with her. I mean, getting in the mud of ministry and seeing the person that you love the most care about the thing that you love as well and doing it together. You know, there's a lot of celebrity couples in the world that everybody wants to be like, right? There's Ross and Rachel for the for the Friends people. My favorite show is The Office, and you have, what, Jim and Pam. Really, I think the best couple in that whole show is Michael and Holly, Right? For the older people in the room, you have Brad and Angelina, right? Yeah. <laughs> I do it. I do it. I just wanted to say it just to see what would happen, right? Uh, but you have these celebrity couples. Everyone's like, I want to be like that. I want to be like, you know what? I'll tell you the truth. I want to be like Priscilla and Aquila. I want to be that person that, man, I'm doing ministry with my wife, and it's to the, I do ministry with my wife so much that it just sounds weird to say Aquila, Right? You just, you think of them together. You think of them doing ministry together. Here's what I want you, man, don't settle for someone who just professes Jesus. You know, pursue somebody who will serve Jesus with you. Third observation, the importance of small groups. 
Paul will go on, and what does he say after he talks about Priscilla and Aquila? He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Verse 5, greet also the church in their house. Now, this is an interesting statement, right? It says, greet the church that is in their house. Well, if, if you've been paying attention, well, I thought the church in Rome, I thought he's writing to the church in Rome. So if they're all a part of the Roman church, then what is this other church that's meeting in their house? Well, this is important for us to understand how the structure of the church would operate in this time. Especially when Christianity was not necessarily very popular. There was not a place where they could all gather together, right? The day of Pentecost, how many people got saved on the day of Pentecost? Mm -hmm. Anybody? You're close. Mercy's close. All right, 3,000. 3,000, right? 3,000 people hear the gospel and respond in faith. Now, here's the thing. There is not a building in Jerusalem big enough to hold 3,000 people for, for, for like a worship service of Christians. So, but what did it say? It said they met daily. They would meet, and they would study the scriptures together, and they would sing, and they would eat food, and they would commune. So how did they do this? They did it how they did it in Rome with Priscilla and Aquila, is that they would meet in smaller groups in people's homes. That the, the New Testament model for the church is not that you come into a room with a thousand people, you sing some songs, you hear a sermon, and then you go home. I want you to understand, and I, I, this, I know this is probably going to step on people's toes. If your experience of church is you come in a room with a bunch of people, you listen to some songs, you sing some songs, you hear some preaching, and then you leave, you are, your church experience is totally foreign to the New Testament. That you may go to church but I would say that you are being disobedient to the commands of Scripture when it says to gather with other believers. Not just, I would say, disobedient. To the point where, like, you might as well not go. The structure of how the church would operate at that time was through smaller groups of people living in community together. Coming to church and sitting in a room with a thousand people uh, and then leaving with no relational connections at all to that group is a type of involvement in a church that the Bible does not show anywhere. Being a part of the church means that you are being involved in a smaller group of people who can actually function the way that the church is commanded to function. Meaning this, this time is important. The time that you were in here, we're singing and this is, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, a smaller group of people. But I want you to understand, the groups that you guys go to of 10, 15, 20 people, like, that's like the lifeblood. That should be the lifeblood of your church experience. The, the, one of the most encouraging things that I have seen lately is after camp, like seeing like people who are in the same small group or whatever, like doing things outside of church together. Those of you who go to the beach or those of you, whatever you guys were doing in the Wakaiba River, I think, or something like that, right? You know, which is cool. But, like, doing those, like, like you know what, here's, like, that's family. You know what I'm trying to say? And you don't have to crack a Bible open every time you get together. But are you there with each other? Are you fellowshipping with one another? Do you know what the other person is struggling with? Do they know what you're struggling with? Do you pray for one another? Are you functioning as the church is commanded to function, to bear with one another, to hold one another accountable, to pray for one another, to lift one another up, to encourage one another, challenge one another? That happens in small groups. And this leads to our last point, which is the importance of relationships. Like I said, Paul addresses 24 individual people. In this last part. Now, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he was a busy man. He even says that I long to go and visit you, uh, but man, and what well, he says, but like God is using me to take the gospel to people who have never heard it before, and I need to do that. But I plan on seeing you soon. And I mean, there's like, man, there's, and he has like intimate relationships with these people by name. The first person to be converted to Christ in Asia, he's like, yeah, named him. 
All of these people named them, named them, named them, named this person. Oh, that woman who was like a, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rufus's mom who was like a mother to me, man. Like, say hi to her for me. All these, and here's what I want you to understand. Busyness for Jesus should never take the place of personal relationships with other Christians. You may be busy. You are not busier than the Apostle Paul. And if the Apostle Paul, who is planning churches all throughout Asia, doing multiple missionary trips, all of these other things, most of it at the risk of his life, will eventually be arrested. Man, he is a man who is driven on a mission, but he never lost sight of the fact that we are called to relationships with one another. I want you to know something, guys, that as much as I am proud to the, be the pastor of this group, I want you to know that my real heart is I want to be a pastor to you as an individual. You with me? Yes, I am the student pastor, but I want you to see that like I am like Jacob's pastor. Or I'm Eva's pastor, or I'm Jenna's pastor, or I'm Jeremy's pastor. You know what I'm trying to say? It's, it's people. It's more than just, you know, I want you to know that if you are missing out on that personal relationship, then we, we're missing something. Never get so busy doing things for Jesus that you neglect real relationships with real people. You need people. Paul's going to go on. He's going to address different people who helped him in different ways. He mentions Priscilla and Aquila risked their lives for him. He misses this other woman who ra- like, basically was like another mother to him. He speaks of all these people who did these incredible things to serve him and to help him and all these different things. I want you to understand, guys, is that when we talk about the mission of, t- of making disciples and all of these different things, a lot of attention goes to the person who gets the recognition and the platform. But it's important to know that no one person can accomplish the mission on their own. Right? That you may see me up here every week and, you know, even on, two, on, on Sundays and, you know, and you're like, oh, that's the youth pastor on the stage. Look at that, you know, or whatever. And that, that's cool. But I want you to understand, like, I don't do, I, I'm, like, the, way, the reason I can do the things that the Lord's called me to do is because I have real relationships with people who hold me up when I can't hold myself up. I have people like a Charlie Peterson that I can go play disc golf like I did yesterday with him and just kind of hang out and chill. I have my wife who prays for me on a daily basis and holds me accountable and lifts me up. I have people like my brother, and I have all of these different people who, man, and here's what I want you to understand, guys, is that if you're seeking to fulfill what God has called you to do, especially if you feel some call towards missions or towards pastoral ministry or whatever like this, and you don't have people who, as, as, as William Carey says, are holding the rope for you, then you need to invest in that. You need to invest in that. And, I, I, and here's what I want to say. The reason, why is this all important? Because notice what I remember what I said earlier, the, that this is all application to the gospel. That you can't say that you take the gospel seriously if you don't take the church seriously. The church, with, which Christ will say is, is his bride. It's like if you came to my house and you were very kind to me and all these different things, but you disrespected my wife, blatantly you may think we're tight but we're not nearly as tight as you may think you are likewise if you say that you and Jesus are tight but you're not tight with his bride the church then maybe you're not as tight as you think you are the church is a gift this is a gift and part of the reason and here's again it's full of broken and imperfect people right including me my wife will tell you one of the challenges I have when I preach, especially like on a Sunday morning, I will preach and my wife, my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, my brother, m- both of my sisters, their spouses, the people who know me like you would not believe are sitting in the room. And when I say something, I better make sure that I live a life that at least can, they can, you know, sit with conviction under and know that, hey, like he's, 
He may be an idiot, but he's not a liar, right? The church is important, man. It's a gift. Enjoy it. God has been good to us. God has been good to you. And one of the ways that he's been good to us is through the gospel, and another way is through providing the church. So don't take it for granted. What we're going to do now is we're going to respond. We're going we're gonna to sing. Some of us in this room, man, when we hear this, we're like, oh, you know, maybe you're convicted of like, maybe I just don't take the church seriously like I should. Maybe you feel like, uh, maybe you've, you know, any of those points that I mentioned, maybe you feel like you've kind of been settling rather than seeking somebody who will pursue Jesus with you. You just settle for somebody who says they're a Christian and they can breathe, right? Maybe you're somebody who, man, you get busy doing stuff for Jesus, but you miss out on spending time with the people of Jesus. Or maybe you're, maybe you're a young lady in this room and you feel like, man, God has a special calling on your life to serve him in the church, but you feel like hesitation because of what people have said. And, you, know, you know what? But you're like, you know what? No, I, I have a renewed commitment. I want to do what the Lord has called me to do. You know what? I want to just give you a moment to pray because I think all of us can be better in one of these areas.